Greetings and welcome, class. This is week two of CIS 4710's Information Security. This is Professor Brown, and we are going to be exploring um, not managing risk. Wait, one. There we go. Right class, right lecture. Sorry about that. Again, uh, <laughs> welcome to CIS 4710. Uh, this is Professor Brown, and it is week two. We are going to be exploring Chapter 2, Networking Foundations. And this is primarily a review um, for the uh, prerequisites of the class. Uh, CIS, primarily CIS 2670, I believe, the network class, and uh, a little bit of the operating system class as well. Uh, for those of you who are on the old quarter system that may be returning, this would be a review of some of the fundamentals of CIS 307. Um, so first off, a you know understanding or good understanding of the OSI uh, seven-layer model. And with this, we have to be looking uh, and knowing what goes on what layer and what layer reacts with each other. And this is primarily used as a reference model, it's called a reference model, to help you learn how to troubleshoot. If somebody presents you a problem, know what layer it falls on, that problem falls on, or what between what layers it falls on. And that gives you a um, vision or a uh, understanding of where to look and what devices to look at, et cetera, to troubleshoot issues. On the same lines, the TCP IP model, uh, smaller, more condensed model, uh, but they are relative to one another. The OSI interconnect model uh, is used more than the TCP IP model, again, primarily for troubleshooting. Uh, also, in the chapter, we go over different topologies. And again, this is a review. A lot of these topologies are used in minute places, and we'll talk about the hybrid topology a little bit later that kind of brings everything together. But a bus is just a simple topology that interconnects devices together. You see this a lot because every switch is basically a bus. It is has a bunch of ports on it, and it shares the same backplane. Uh, we have star topologies, which kind of expands that bus out. So there's a bus that's sitting here, but from a logical perspective, we connect all the devices and we expand out and we now have a star. A ring is what we get when we have, um, typically see this in um, metropolitan area networks where you might be sharing a medium. Uh, but ring topologies are also used in wireless, the way that uh, tokens are handled, um, wireless tokens for the ability for stations to transmit and or receive. And then we have mesh where we can bring, and hybrid technology, as I say, where we can bring everything together. Um, and a mesh topology, which helps us bring uh, things into perspective. That hybrid topology is where we are going to connect a lot of these different uh, topologies together, and you see this a lot in everyday um, networking. So, then there's the physical aspect of networking, where we have addressing and method switching, routing. Uh, this takes place at different layers, primarily layer two and layer three. You don't have addressing at layer one because you're just dealing with ones and zeros, but at layer two and layer three, we are dealing with either hardware addressing, layer two, MAC addresses, or logical addressing, layer three, typically IP addressing. And it doesn't matter whether it's IPv4 or IPv6. Now, for the next few slides, we're going to get into looking at the header formats of the uh, different protocols that we use at, between layer three and layer four. Primarily here at layer three, we're looking at the IP version 4 uh, header. The primary thing to understand here is that the IP header is 32 bits in length, and you have a lot of different uh, sections of it. We have version numbering, the type of service, 
Uh, of course, source and destination address, the time to live that gets counted backwards every time we uh, go across the hop of a network, a checksum for uh, integrity sanity, uh, the total link, fragment offset, etc. And then many options that you can put at the tail end of the IP header. So it's good to understand and have a good conceptual basis of the difference between IPv4 and IPv6. The primary um, reason we went to IPv6 was because of address exhaustion. We ran out of IPv4 addresses. Now, if you would have told me that 25 years ago when I came into this industry, I probably would have laughed in your face because we had millions and millions and millions of IP addresses. Network address translation was just coming about, and that was going to expand it exponentially. <clears throat> and I still had a public, uh, I still had a public IP address on my military computer sitting on my desk. So, yeah, it is amazing how things change over time. Will we ever exhaust IPv6? Again, I'm going to probably sit here and laugh in your face and go, no, there's like billions and billions of addresses that will ne never say never, okay? Well, especially with the advent of IoT where our toasters and our refrigerators are getting IP addresses and our televisions, our smart screens, you know, who knows? Who knows? When uh, we expand out and uh, extend networks out into the solar system to Mars or Titan or who knows where, you never, ever know. So never say never, I guess, is the rule of that story. Um, but with IPv6, there's no more NAT. There's uh, auto configuration. It's very much automated. The, he the header is very much streamlined. Um, and simplified, uh, it's more efficient for routing, and it works with uh, newer dynamic routing protocols such as OSPF version 3. Okay, so I don't go too much into subnets and subnetting uh, because you probably should have been beaten about the head and shoulders a lot with this, and you should know it, right? Well, I hope so, because you're going to have to have an understanding of it. You're not going to be doing subnetting, but you need to know how to read uh, CIDR notation. You need to understand what route summarization is in this class. Uh, so you can set up different parts of scripts and different parts of scans correctly. Another foundational piece that they cover is the TCP three-way handshake. This is very critical to understand because when we get into system hacking um, and we talk about session hijacking, this concept uh, within TCP IP is very critical because we learn how to manipulate this process for our own ill-gotten gain and to hijack a session or take over the control of a device. So with that, the TCP header doesn't really change much between, you know, versions. Uh, source port and source destination instead of addresses. Addressing, of course, being handled with IP. Sequencing numbers so that we can put packets back into correct order if they become uh, out, of, out, of, out of sequence. Uh, acknowledgement numbers so that we know and can track the session. Uh, reserved. Uh, flags and data offsets, window sizing, which is very critical for um, throughput calculation options, and then, of course, your data. Uh, with UDP, it's connectionless, whereas TCP is connection-oriented with that three-way handshake. It is what I like to call fire and forget and used with real-time applications such as voice and video. You can manipulate UDP to a certain extent, but it's harder because you never are expecting any type of feedback or um, response from those protocols and those services or applications. With Internet Control Message Protocol, ICMP, this is used primarily for sanity checking to see if a system is alive or on the network, say with the ping command, or looking at your route through the network with traceroute. The problem with it is in modern networks, for the most part, it is turned off. So we hardly ever see it um, out there at, at all. Uh, we do turn it on primarily for troubleshooting more than anything else. 
and we use it uh, or can be used, I should say, for malicious purposes, typically within denial of service attacks. But if uh, devices such as firewalls or intrusion prevention devices know how to handle this, they drop the packets and, you know, no harm, no foul. So uh, the other part of the chapter is understanding the network types. And I added a couple others in here that or might be outside of your chapter that you should have learned about in your um, 3100 class, three, uh, CIS 310, the old quarter um, designation. Uh, local area networks, everything's local to you. Uh, it's, a ge it's a geographical location, so same building, same floor, uh, same general location. And also, you're in the same subnet. A VLAN is a virtual LAN where you can have ports on one switch in one area, ports on another switch in, say, another floor or another building, and they're on the same network. They're on the same subnet. LANs are all about being on the same subnet. Wide area networks, or WANs, are different subnets, and they are separated by geography, by geography. Uh, and they are routed uh, between those locations. A MAN, or metropolitan area network, I never really gave this a whole lot of thought until I had to manage one. Uh, I managed a couple of metropolitan area networks for municipalities, for cities. And it really kind of uh, drove home that concept. This is a conceptual understanding of networking more than it is a geographical um, one. So understanding that you have a shared network that customers or services can join, but it's managed centrally by one entity, in this case, in many cases, by like a city. Uh, and then you have PAN, your personal area network. This is Bluetooth-driven. Uh, and IoT devices are getting into this uh, con concept more and more and more, um, especially as we have more devices that we leverage on a walking around basis. The headphones that I'm using right now are Bluetooth. They can connect to my phone. They can connect to my PC. My phone connect can connect to my P PC. Uh, I have a microphone that can do the same thing. I mean, it's it's a matter of locality. Okay, uh, other pieces today that we uh, I want to talk about in cloud computing, and it just so happens I have a um, story to share about this. Uh, as I do research on a daily basis, and I really encourage all of you to uh, look at and um, get comfortable with uh, websites and gaining factual information in cybersecurity because stuff changes every day new information new research comes out every day new vulnerabilities come out every day and it's you have to start staying on top of it now um from as far as cloud computing is concerned they cover the different storage area networks platforms as a service um, uh, infrastructure as a service software as a service etc uh the Cloud compute is basically broken down into four areas, storage, compute, database, and software. A lot of times people get storage and database mixed up or they see it as the same thing, or they get compute and software mixed up and see it as the same thing. They are four different entities altogether. Uh, for those of you who were in uh, the 2670 class, you may have gone through the uh, AWS practitioner um, uh, test. And that kind of lays out at a very high level uh, the areas of cloud computing. Uh, there are other providers out there, not just AWS, but Microsoft Azure. And Google has a very robust cloud service that is growing and starting to get competitive uh, with these other um, providers as well. Now, on that note, I wanted to – I'm going to be on my other screen here, look, Googling this. I uh, did this in my in-person class the other day. Um, hopefully I can get the... I can find the article.
Here we go. Found it. I'll provide this URL, or you can see it at least. As I pull it over here. So this uh, article from Info Security Group, their Info Security Mag, you can see the uh, uh, URL right there. Uh, if you basically, what I Googled was infosec-magazine space CISO, and it came up to the very, very top. Uh, this is an article that um, they did a, kind of a research project on, and they went out and inter interviewed 274 CISOs, CTOs, and CIOs uh, across the UK and the US, and they found some really interesting facts. Uh, about them. So basically they were uh, on the fence as to whether the cloud is secure for their organization or not. And they're about uh, halfway between uh, thinking it is and thinking it is not. Uh, unsurprisingly, those with a multi-cloud strategy, meaning they use more than one provider, they might use AWS and Azure. Uh, were most likely to have suffered a breach in the past year. 52% said they had. Um, a lot of them, 71%, were moderately or very or extremely concerned that a malicious activity or, or breach is going to happen in their cloud infrastructure. Okay? So this is a trend, and, and, and you're seeing this with the familiarity and comfort, uh, the comfortability, how comfortable you are, with the cloud um, because there's a lot of risk that they are taking with going to the cloud. <clears throat> so uh, take a read of this. I found it very interesting um, that, you know, this is the mindset, this is the thinking of the, the leaders in IT at this point in time. Uh, finally today, I'm going to have you watch a TED Talk video. Um, you can see it here. I did this in my in-person class as well. Uh, if you just uh, go to YouTube and you type in Confessions of a Cyber Spy Hunter, uh, it'll come up. And watch this video. Now, <clears throat> this is really interesting, and it's about six years old. Um, uh, six or seven, almost seven years old now. But it's very interesting because you can kind of understand <clears throat> what the prospectus is of cyber warfare, of cyber spying. And you can see just if you've kept up with the no news and haven't been living under a rock over the last four or five years, uh, you can see how this is developing. And then take that with a grain of salt and go, okay, well, this has happened. Where are we going from here? The other reason I want you to watch this video is um, Mr. Winsboro uh, lays out the methodology that progressed for the Stuxnet worm uh, to take down the Iranian nuclear industry. Uh, very interesting talk about how he how he did that. And he also talks about a little bit about history about other viruses and worms, in particular uh, Code Red and the Melissa virus. So it uh, gives, gives a lot of good pers uh, perspective. So this is the other 20 minutes of your lecture today. So I'm right at about 19, 20 minutes now. So uh, read that article. Uh, go ahead and watch this video. And I will be posting tomorrow uh, the lab portion for this week. Uh, hopefully you've downloaded the VM to your machine, and uh, we're going to be ready to roll with that tomorrow uh, in, in the lab section of, of the class, or this week in the lab section, and uh, I will post a video of that as well uh, as just kind of a general guideline uh, for this week. So I'm going to sign off for now. Uh, this is Professor Brown, week two, uh, 4710. Hope you had um, a good week, and we'll see you next week.